You're welcome. <laughs> She's just representing how our morning has been here at the church. It's been, it's been a fun morning. If you're in fifth through eighth grade, as the sign says on the screen behind me, you can head out to your classroom now and hang out with your lovely teachers. Hey, I'm glad that all of you are here with us this morning. If this is your first time, welcome. If this is your 100th time, we're grateful that you have come back. We're honored to have you and the gift that you are in our community this morning. Whether you arrived here this morning because of an internet search or because you were invited or because you already knew the way, your presence in our space is important, it is significant, and we are grateful that you are here. We pray for you every Sunday morning before the celebration, and our prayer for you is threefold. Actually, it's fourfold. The first is that you might experience welcome that you would experience acceptance, that you would experience peace. And more than all of that, what we hope for is that you would have an encounter with the loving presence of the living God. Last week, we entered into the story of the healing of Bartimaeus found in Luke chapter 18. If you didn't get a sermon handout, I would invite you to do that, or a Bible, because we'll be in Luke chapter 19. Or you can use your smartphone or your iPad. Or if you've memorized and hit the Lord's word into your heart, we're going to be in Luke 19 this morning, the first seven or eight verses. Now, this healing of Bartimaeus takes place as Jesus is making his way through the historic city of Jericho on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which is the meal of the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt into prosperity uh, with his disciples. Now, after the healing of Bartimaeus, Jesus continues on his way. He's passing through the city of Jerusalem, and this is where we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Jesus entered the city of Jericho, and he was passing through. Now, I've said that three times. You might underline it because I'm going to come back to it. It's significant. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. You have to pay attention sometimes because the gospel writers make note of things that are significant for us. He was a tax collector, and he was wealthy. If you underline either in your notes or in your own Bible, note the fact that he was wealthy. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he read ahead of the crowd, and he climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Now Luke wants us to catch a few things, which may seem trivial to us at first glance. The first one is this, Jesus was passing through Jericho. Luke wants us to know that what's going to transpire here over the next few verses was not planned. Jesus was just passing through to get to the other side, as it were. He didn't have any plans to stay the night in Jericho. So why is this important to Luke? Well, for Luke, he wants it to help shape and form how we understand what Jesus does as he enters into the city. See, some scholars believe that the people of Jericho, when they went out, as I noted last week, to meet Jesus as he was coming into the city, they wanted to throw him a banquet. Maybe to get Jesus to stay in the city a little bit longer. Maybe for him to teach them a thing or two, perform some miracles, or unveil the kingdom of God in their midst. But Jesus was set for Jerusalem. He was a man on a mission. He had to get to Jerusalem because he was eager to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. Now, many of us know how that Passover story goes. It's sort of a meal. A table was set. Friends were invited. A meal was prepared and set out. And then there was the retelling of a familiar story, the story of the Exodus. Yet this retelling, the one that Jesus will tell his disciples at this last Passover, will be infused with new meaning. So Luke really wants us to understand that Jesus wasn't planning to stay in Jericho. He was just passing through. What happens is spontaneous, almost like the healing 
of Bartimaeus. And here's my observation. When Jesus is present, he is present and he sees. As Jesus is making his way through Jericho, a tax collector, Zacchaeus, tries to get a look at Jesus. Now, any of us who have studied the text or been in children's ministry with the felt board, when we've talked about the story of Zacchaeus, your storyteller may have focused on this one detail, that Zacchaeus was short, as if there's something wrong with that. (laughs) So Zacchaeus had to make a way for him to see the master. So he runs ahead and climbs a sycamore fig tree to get a look at Jesus. Now, what the storytellers and our authoritative interpreters often miss when they retell this story found in Luke 19 is they don't highlight that it wasn't just that Zacchaeus was short, but it was that Zacchaeus was hated. Now, as we enter into the story, we have to remind ourselves of the culture in which we receive the story. Zacchaeus was a hated other. He was a tax collaborator with Rome. Instead of fighting the occupying force, he instead joined with those who were actively oppressing and subjugating his people. And Luke makes a point to tell us that Zacchaeus was wealthy. The fact that Zacchaeus was rich is an indication that he was likely cheating his people to enrich himself. He was what we might call a sinner, just like Matthew, the other tax collector, who uh, later became a disciple of Jesus, Zacchaeus is despised and hated. Zacchaeus and his family were also considered unclean. Now let me push in just for a moment on this concept of being unclean. This meant that he and his family were excluded from the fellowship with other Jews. If you were ceremoniously unclean, that meant you couldn't come to church, so you wouldn't be able to be here in the space with us. You'd have to watch us from the comfort of your home on our live stream, which sometimes buffers and stutters and jumps around. All right, just in case it was doing it now. We need a faster internet connection, but you know, like everything, it costs. They were prevented from their charitable gifts that they gave, their tithes and offerings. Can you imagine anybody refusing tithes and offerings? In the ancient world, if you were unclean, your charitable offerings were returned to you. They were returned to you. We don't want what you are offering because you are unclean. Now catch this. Scholars note that in the Jewish um, sort of commentaries around the law, some rabbis actually wrote a provision into their commentaries that said, when you are dealing with a tax collector, it is permissible for you to lie. That's a Ten Commandment violation. That's the highest of the laws. That's how hated tax collectors were, you can go ahead and lie to them. God will give you a pass. The hatred was deep. It was deep. Finally, any attempt to atone for his sins was blocked because he was not allowed, he was not even permitted to go to the temple to make his sacrifices. And what this did is this kept Zacchaeus and his family in a perpetual state of sinfulness and exclusion. See, that's what we don't always get when we come into this story. So when Jesus, in verse 5, reaches the spot, the tree where um, Zacchaeus is, he looks up and he says to, to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. Remember that at the beginning of this two-part section, it's Luke 18, 38 through uh, 19, 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
Bartimaeus rushes out and he sees Jesus because Jesus is just passing through. And when Bartimaeus calls out, what Jesus does is he stops and he hears and he interacts. And we see that unfolding right now. We see Jesus stopping, addressing Zacchaeus by name and requesting to stay with him. It's almost like what he did with the beggar all over again. This whole idea that when Jesus is present, he sees, right? I mean, I think we just have to process that a little bit, that when he is present, he is present. And therefore, it means he sees and stops and gives space to us. Now, here are some implications that are worth considering. First, Zacchaeus is a sinner and a tax collector. So he has a double sort of status here. And as I've noted, that means he's unclean. Now, in the first century, the Jews had a strict set of guidelines that governed their daily lives, including what someone who is considered clean could do with someone who was considered unclean. Now, this is lost on us. It's completely and utterly lost on us. So the closest analog that I could think of was the segregated South. There was a clearly defined, understood, and mostly followed set of guidelines for how people who look like me interacted with whites. In one sense, the, the setup between those who were non-white in comparison to those who were white, you could hear those who were white saying, this is actually good because it helps order our daily life, it keeps the best uh, peace for us, and it avoids us mixing the races. Now, from the modern reader's understanding, cleanliness and uncleanness may seem childish and petty to many of us. But I just want to push in here for a moment and remind us that segregation in our country was only officially ended 60 years ago. It was only officially ended 60 years ago. And here's the rub. We still find that our country, especially our public schools, are still racially segregated and also segregated by income level. Did you know that Ann Arbor has the distinction of being the eighth most segregated city in America by income level? That's an interesting distinction. I mean, we're better than Ohio State. They're number four in Columbus. But it's not really something we should be that proud of. The eighth most segregated city in the United States by income level. So therefore, that has implications, in case you don't realize, about who can live in the city, who can work in the city, who your kids will interact with within the city. That all comes because of this racial, or rather, this income inequality. So when we think of the ancients as being petty because they segregated people based on cleanliness rules, we might want to check ourselves to look at how we are segregating ourselves along economic means. So as we enter into the text here, we may want to lean towards those who were held in captivity. They were being ruled by pagan rulers who were crushing and oppressing them. And those who are under oppression, they often want one thing, they want an end to their oppression. And so the Jews of Jesus' day had devised a plan for how to end their oppression. It was really simple. We will follow the strict law of God. Because they had a belief, which is this. If we are observant, holy, righteous, effectively what we would call good, then God will intervene on our behalf. He will come into our situation and he will throw off those who are oppressing us. So you can begin to understand how they saw the world. Yet Jesus, who is someone who claims to be a rabbi sent from God, was disrupting the apple cart. He was doing what was prohibited in the ancient world. A rabbi eating, associating with, and being entertained by sinners. 
Now, with this understanding, Jesus eating with sinners would do what? Well, it would delay God's ability to respond and intervene because there was one within the community who was unclean. If you wanted God to intervene, then your duty as a law abiding, observant Jew was to put off those who were considered unclean. You had to keep the law. Second, how did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? Now, one way you can think of it is you can say, well, Jesus used his son of God magic powers, right? Like he has these, he's the son of God, so he knows everyone's name, he knows everything about everyone, so as he's walking around, he can see your sins, like strolling before him like the matrix, right? I mean, that, that's just, like for some of us, that's actually how we see Jesus. Let me give you another way that Jesus knew his name that doesn't involve him activating his, you know, son of God magic powers. The people hated Zacchaeus. And so they saw him run up the tree and they were like, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? Leave the master alone. Zacchaeus, we hate you. We don't want you around. So he probably, while being with the people, heard the man's name. And therefore, he used it. See, Zacchaeus was the hated other, being insulted, taunted, jeers. So Jesus decides to call Zacchaeus down from his tree, and Jesus does something that's also a bit strange. He's a guest inviting himself over for dinner. <laughs> Seriously, when's the last time you actually like, let someone do that? <laughs> Right when they were just like, hey, I'm here, like, make me some fried chicken, you know, <laughs> I'm ready, you know, and it's just like, uh, that's not how it works, right? You usually invite people over, but here is Jesus inviting himself. Now, remember, this is the same crowd that a moment ago when Jesus heals Bartimaeus, or yeah, the blind beggar, they praise God, they rejoice, they praise Jesus in a sense. But now what Jesus is doing is going to change their attitude. In fact, they turn on him. Let's read in verse 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now we see that and we go, oh, because we've been taught that we're all sinners. And so, you know, we just glance right past that. We, we just glance past all of the context that's in that part of the passage. What on earth could have made the crowd turn on Jesus so quickly? How would Jesus have felt, having just healed Bartimaeus, and moments later now inviting himself over to Zacchaeus, and now being rejected by the crowd? How would that make him feel? Well, they turn on Jesus because he isn't doing what they expect him to do. Here, let me try to capture what I think the crowd may have wanted Jesus to say. I think they want Jesus to say something like this. Zacchaeus, you're a sinful tax collector, a sinful tax collaborator with Rome. You've turned your back on your people, on your God, and on yourself. Don't you realize that in this act of serving the empire, you are working against God? You have become an oppressor to your people, Zacchaeus, an oppressor of these good people that are all around you. Don't you see what you're doing? Crushing them with your oppression. You are oppressing the people by draining them of their resources, not so that you can try to buy back the land and give them an opportunity to plant new seed, to produce more wealth, but no, instead, Zacchaeus, so that you can line your own pockets. Zacchaeus, let me tell you who you are. You are a wicked man. And let me tell you that this community, this community's hatred of you, Zacchaeus, it's justified. You should be grateful they haven't dragged you out to the city gates and dug a hole and put you in it and stoned you for what you've done because who you are, that's what you would deserve. Zacchaeus, here's what you need to do in order to be right with God. You need to break your alliance today with Rome. You need to quit your job. You need to repent and follow me to Jerusalem so that you may go to the temple and be purified by the priests. And after you've made an offering which can atone for your sins, then you can come back home. And you must 
Zacchaeus, in order to have right standing with God again, you must follow the law, Zacchaeus. What's more, you must also make amends to these people you have wronged and cheated. You must pay restitution. And if you do all of this, when I come back this way from Jerusalem, then I will be able to come into your house, which has been purified and clean by your action. And I will offer you my praise and acceptance. Now, that's what the people wanted Jesus to say. Yet he doesn't say any of that. Instead, he does something that offends a lot of us because we don't identify with Zacchaeus. We put ourselves firmly in the crowd. He accepts Zacchaeus as he is. There it is again, that acceptance paradox. On the one hand, we are accepted as we are, And on the other, we are called to radical transformation. See, Zacchaeus, who is worthy to be put to death, he's the sinner, is accepted. Zacchaeus, the sinner who is lining his pockets with the the hard-earned money of the people, is accepted and loved by God. This person who is despised and hated is accepted. A traitor is accepted. He's really one of us, and he's accepted. What Jesus was proposing to have dinner with Zacchaeus and staying the night with Zacchaeus was unimaginable. Let me keep pushing in on this uncleanliness thing because the way it worked in the ancient world was if you were unclean, everything you touched was unclean. Everything. You sit in a chair and you're unclean. The chair is now unclean. No one else can sit in the chair until you've been purified and the chair has been purified. Therefore, you can't sit at table with somebody. You can't break bread with somebody. You can't lie in their sheets, right? It's like an infestation of bed bugs that goes with you everywhere and then they fly because they don't fly. But now in this picture, they fly and they contaminate everything and everyone around you. Can you begin to understand why this is significant? You know, if a friend tells you they have bed bugs, are you likely to stay at their house? No. Oh, I, I, I would actually take, I think I have $100 in my pocket. I would be willing to leverage $100 that none of you would stay. Because you don't even want to take the risk of having their eggs maybe come home with you and infest your own house. That was Jesus with Zacchaeus. Are you able to come into the story? No? Can I, should I tell you some more horrific stories? <laughs> This is huge that Jesus stays with him. Jesus, by virtue of staying with Zacchaeus, becomes ceremoniously unclean, which means he would not be accepted in the temple. But Jesus doesn't become unclean. There are all these pictures in the scripture that uh, I love of Jesus doing and interacting with people who have been marginalized, uh, like the person who has a skin disease. You can't touch that person because you might contract it. You might become unclean yourself. But what Jesus reveals to us is the very picture of God, that what's going on with us doesn't corrupt him. And that's a picture we have to have of God because sometimes we think of ourselves as being so unworthy that we can't ever come to God until we clean ourselves up first. Can you imagine how silly that is? But it's exactly how we live oh, I'm in this sinful state, I've done this wrong, I've, I haven't been forgiven, I haven't forgave, you know, and, and I don't want to interact with you, God. And God is like, but that's okay, I still love you. I want you to know my love for you. See, all of the people saw what Jesus did by going and visiting with Zacchaeus, and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Isn't it interesting that in the beginning of this story, the blind beggar, that crowd who was at first hostile, but then they, they expressed their joy and delight at the beggar's healer. This was their approval of Jesus and his healing ministry, the unfolding of grace and mercy, the coming of the kingdom of God in their midst. 
Yet in this story, with this same crowd, they refuse to extend the same approval to Jesus when he engages the hated other. The community shuts Jesus out when he decides to fellowship with Zacchaeus. It's almost as if Jesus is shifting the shame, the condemnation, and the hatred of Zacchaeus onto himself. It's almost like a type and shadow of what Jesus will demonstrate on the cross when he takes on the powers of sin and evil and death to heal us, to free us from our captivity. It's striking to me that Jesus doesn't side with the crowd. He also, just in case you're wondering where I'm going with this, he also doesn't endorse Zacchaeus' oppression either. Did you hear what I said? Let me just say it again, because you may have heard more than I was saying. Let me just say it again. On the one side, he doesn't side with the crowd that's rejecting Zacchaeus, but he also doesn't endorse Zacchaeus' oppression. He accepts Zacchaeus, not what he does. Yet in this culture, the culture in which Jesus is operating in, you were guilty by association. So what does Jesus do instead? He loves Zacchaeus. He loves him. He loves him. You know, there's this theological concept that I love. It's called the hermeneutic of love. It's going to come up on the screen because it's your 50 cent word for today, hermeneutic. Let me unpack what I think the basic uh, meaning is. And I've, I've been working on this, so if you don't like it, you can send me a better one. Anna and I were talking this morning, putting our heads together to get it as clean as we could. Here's my concept of what I mean when I talk about a hermeneutic of love. When you are operating with a hermeneutic of love, the love that you're operating with doesn't seek to control, to compel, to change, or to collapse the other. The other retains who they are. Instead, when you are operating in this kind of love, you seek to understand and be understood by the one you love, the beloved. Therefore, what happens in that is space gets created for the beloved to fully themselves as they lose themselves in the love of the other. See, this is why it's a con you know, like it, it's a big word, and then it's a very complicated explanation as well. Here, here's how Anna and I sort of processed it. One way of it is, you know how when you meet somebody that's new. And one of the first things that you do if you're having coffee or dinner or you're going for a walk with them or if it's a date, uh, you're trying to put on your best uh, face with them, you say something along the lines of, tell me your story. Why do you do that? Well, you want to create some space for you to get to know the other. And while the person is telling the story, do you find yourself changing their story? Like, that's not really what happened. That's not really who you are. That's not how this all unfolded and how this all worked. No. You often, I mean, unless you're that person, you often, you often let them tell their story and you listen to it. And what do you often listen for? Intersection. You listen for intersections where your story lines up with their stories because what you are hoping to achieve is a connection. And so this hermeneutic of love for me is this idea that we allow the other to be the other. And that love is what exists between us. Take the healing of the story of Bartimaeus, for example. That's why I'm doing this in a two-parter. Actually, this sermon today is a two-parter because I'm going to finish it in uh, next week. Um, when Jesus stops and asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus, in one sense, is using the hermeneutic of love. Because what he allows is he allows Bartimaeus to choose what he wants instead of giving Bartimaeus what is obviously what he needs, which is healing. And by doing that, what Jesus does is he respects the humanity of Bartimaeus. That's how God is with us. He has everything that we need, but he will not force himself upon us. 
We have to be humble in heart in order to accept what he has to offer us. See, instead of trying to make Bartimaeus into the person that Jesus wants him to be, that he should be, that he could be, Jesus instead accepts Bartimaeus as he is and loves him as he is. And guess what that does, friends? It opens the door for actual radical transformation. See, we... <laughs> woo. See, we love to talk about tough love and all of that, right? Like, oh, I got to be tough in my love. Man, we don't want God to be tough in his love towards us. We just want God to be tough in his love towards them. Come on, right? Like, this is the reality of what he's saying. Costly love, when it actually is allowed to unfold, creates an opening for radical transformation. What would it look like if we radically love those in our lives? That's a whole nother sermon, and it is not on my notes. I'm not even going to go there. For Bartimaeus to become fully himself, he has to be fully loved. Isn't that interesting? Because this is exactly what happens with Zacchaeus. Verse 8. But Zacchaeus, and and now we're at his house. Luke doesn't tell you that, but I'm going to verse 8. They've moved from the outside, inside. The meal is prepared. They've been reclining, drinking wine for a while. And then this happens. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus says to him in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus accepts his newfound status as one who is loved and accepted, and that leads him to repentance. It's exactly what we see in the story of the blind beggar Bartimaeus. When the beggar sees himself as Jesus does, he repents and he accepts Jesus as Lord. Zacchaeus does the same thing as he accepts the good shepherd who has found him. He rejoices by surrendering. Friends, this is very, very powerful because this is what love does. Now, we're going to stop right here today because um, I need a whole nother sermon to unpack the last two verses, verses eight and nine, because I think it is really, really striking what we see in um, Zacchaeus' story. Uh, before I uh, go into my practical tips, I want to deviate for a second and welcome back the Paladinos who have uh, returned from Vancouver. Dave's down here with his hand. Dave and his wife, uh, Jen Paladino, and their son, Ethan, were um, away for a year uh, studying, and so he's now back and. I, among others, are glad to have him back in the community. And I want to say goodbye, unfortunately, uh, to the Harrises. Where are you guys? I just saw you there, Elaine and Stephen, and their kids, Jude and Zachary, and Zachary's brother, Alex. There it is, because it was like all these names in my head. They're heading back to the United Kingdom, um, mainly because the queen is now celebrating her 90th birthday or 90th year ruling. I'm not sure which it is. It must be her birthday. So her 90th birthday, so they need to get back to pay homage to the queen. No, their time here in Ann Arbor is come to an unfortunate and quick end, and so we've been so grateful for your presence in our community and your blessing. And so we pray that God would bless you, that he would keep you, that he would cause his mercy and his grace to shine upon you as you travel and return home. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is a hard thing we do here at this church. We constantly are saying hello and goodbye to people as they come and go. I'm grateful for those of you uh, as you move in and out of the space. I don't know what I was going to say, so I'm not going to say it. Here are my practical tips. Number one, let's join with Zacchaeus in our surrender. The band, you guys can make your way back. You know, I think we have these um, surrender prayers. They're supposed to be, oh, they're down here. That was a really bad thing. I'm sorry, Ryan. (laughs) I didn't know I was going to do that. (laughs) There are speakers down there. Reverb. 
that was just to wake you up. So we have these active surrender prayers, which I'll put on the front of the stage. But we're going to do this prayer together. And part of why I'm, I'm noting this is our following of Jesus is a daily act of surrender. And I don't think we should ever come to our faith and our connection with God in this whole once and done kind of modality. It's a constant daily surrendering of our agenda and taking up his agenda in order for us to pass through the narrow gate into life from death. And so what I want to do is just invite you, it's on the screen, uh, to pray this prayer of surrender with me. Jesus of Nazareth, I acknowledge my thirst for what you have to give. I surrender myself to you wholly and entirely, what was and is and is to come. Plunge the wrongs I have done and the wrongs done to me into your fathomless mercy. Receive me as I am today. Make me what I am meant to be and let me walk in the path of your new creation. Amen? And so we have that card printed. And now, because of Jake and maybe Peter, they are up here on the steps. And so as you come for communion this morning, you can pick one up. And this is a great thing to just start your day with, or you can also end your day with this, just as a daily reminder of your need of God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness in your life. And then secondly, my second practical tip is like the first, which is to invite us by using the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is found in Luke 4, 11 and 4, Jesus instructs us to ask God to forgive us of our sins. That's how the sentence starts. It goes, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. He links those two together, but he starts with us and says that our call is to ask God to daily forgive us of our missing of the mark. This is a way for us to have solidarity with both the oppressed, like Bartimaeus, the blind man, and the oppressor, Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Because like Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, we're all sinners. And we miss the mark from time to time. And we prayed for you this morning, and Anna had this beautiful prayer, which I wrote down. And it was that God would soften our hearts, that we might be free enough to fully be who we are in the presence of a God who loves us. Not a God who hates us, not a God who's disappointed in us, and not a God who is like wishing that we were our better selves but a God who sees us as we are and invites us daily to take one step closer in surrender. So the second practical tip is to use the spiritual discipline of uh, confession this week. And I have a little guide at the bottom of your sermon handout to guide you to become mindful of our own neediness before God who is loving and merciful, full of grace, and wants to forgive us. Amen? All right, I believe that Sean is going to continue to lead us in our act of worship through our giving. And after Sean does that, he's going to invite Anna Hilliker up to lead us with communion. Um, prayer ministry insights for this morning. Um, the, the softening of our hearts uh, was a theme uh, that I uh, sort of resonated on this morning, that some of us are here and our hearts are a little stony uh, for various reasons. And this could be that God has promised you something and he hasn't delivered on it. It could be that you're not experiencing life the way that you want to right now, and so you're feeling sort of some of the disconnection in that. But there's just, a, think of it, you know, the band, the, the, the drummer on the stage here sits behind some plexiglass to sort of direct the sound. Because if the, the plexiglass isn't there, the sound comes rushing past and can overwhelm what's happening here, or at least that's what I think happens with it. And, and in a sense, it just creates uh, a small barrier. And I think for many of us, that's how our current connection with God is. There's just this barrier. It might be clear, translucent, you can see through it. It might be flimsy, but it's there. And I believe that God wants to, with your consent, tear down that barrier and allow you to experience the overflow of his love. And so I'd like to create some space in the prayer station, which is over here to my left. Come up for communion, and then you can just come over and join us in the prayer station. And we just want to bless you. And we're not, you don't have to confess your sins to us, though if you want to, we'll listen. Um, but th that's not what this is about. It's more about just tearing down whatever the dividing wall might be between you and God 
so that his love might rush in. Amen? Amen. Sean? Amen. So uh, we're going to take a gander at those cards that are in the seat back in front of you. Now's the time to get them out and fill them out using the pens that should be there as well. Uh, if you're new here, we'd love to get to know you, so please do fill out that welcome card. If you can give money, now's the time to do that, so please do. There's a few ways to do it. You can drop cash or checks inside the offering bag as it goes by. There's a giving kiosk out in the lobby that you can use a credit card with, or you can go to our website, annarborvineyard.org, and click on the Give tab at the top of the homepage. So I'll give you a few seconds here to finish filling out your cards. Uh, and the prayer card, too, is pretty rad. We pray for those every week during our staff meetings. So I'll give you about 23 seconds to fill those out. All right, let's pray now for the offering. Father, we want to say thank you for the gifts that you provide for us, the ways that you just give us provision, and we want to give some of that back to you right now, God. And I pray that this would be a real act of worship for each person here that does it, Lord. And we pray, as we always do, Lord, that you'd use these gifts to let the hungry be fed, and lonely be comforted to bless those that are in need. We pray that you would be greatly trusted and praised as we give. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. We'll take our offering now and let's stay seated and we'll sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. go. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. We're so happy to have you. And first of all, we just want to make sure that you know that our communion meal is open to all. So we would love if you would join us for that. Our communion meal comes served as a cup inside of a cup like this with the bread of life in the bottom and the fruit of the vine in the top of the cup. And if you require a gluten-free option, we do have that available. It's only available in the line on my right, and be sure to ask the server for it, which I believe will probably be Donnell. Let us all stand for communion. Today, Donnell invited us to the act of confession, and it's something that um, we have a lot of hang-ups about. And we're going to do a little bit of group confession here, but I want to be sure that you know this isn't to make anyone feel guilty, to make anyone feel excluded to make you feel like you shouldn't come forward for this meal. It's really just so that we can bring ourselves, who we are, where we are, and all of the messiness of that into God's loving, loving presence. So I'm going to use a prayer from Walter Brueggemann, who I love, and it's called We Are Takers. You are the giver of all good things. All good things are sent from heaven above, rain and sun, day and night, justice and righteousness, bread to the eater and seed to the sower, peace to the old, energy to the young, joy to the babe. We are takers who take from you, day by day, daily bread, taking all we need as you supply, taking in gratitude and wonder and joy, and then taking more, 
taking more than we need, taking more than you give us, taking from our sisters and our brothers, taking from the poor and the weak, taking because we are frightened and so greedy, taking because we are anxious and so fearful, taking because we are driven and so uncaring. So give us peace beyond our fear to end our greed. Give us well-being beyond our anxiety and so end our fear. Give us abundance beyond our drivenness and so end our uncaring. Turn our taking into giving since we are in your giving image. Make us giving like you, giving gladly and not taking, giving in abundance, not taking, giving in joy, not taking, giving as he gave himself up for all of us, giving, never taking. Amen. We're going to pray together using the words that Jesus taught us to pray, and they're on the screen behind me. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll come to communion in two rows down the center. I am a child 
Well 